on those living in the pitch black darkness of a long forgotten place where spirits were dimmed and hopes were dashed and the future grew bleak and the world grew weary of itself a light finally shined at first distant and faint it rose quietly over the people like the dawning of the sun until deep shadows gave way to sunbursts of light and weeping gave way to outbursts of joy and divine absence gave way to glad presence at the sound of a baby's first cry the christmas story is about a promise fulfilled an age old prophecy come to pass unto the ancients before us and now unto us and unto everyone who comes after us into every pitch dark place that ever has been and ever will be a light shines eternally in the form of a child given a wonderful counselor mighty god everlasting father prince of peace who calls us to walk in the light and love of god join us this advent as we wait for the light and welcome the child who meets us where we are and takes us by the way that leads to the kingdom of god Good morning, St. Andrew family, and welcome to our Sunday morning online worship service. I'm Justin Bullis, and it is my privilege to welcome you here today from the St. Andrew Chapel. I'm grateful, as always, to share this sacred online space with you, where we are all invited, included, and valued as vital and beloved members of our broader worshiping community. St. Andrew is proud to be an open, affirming, inclusive congregation that welcomes all people into the full life and communion of our church. This includes saints and sinners, believers and skeptics, the lost and the found, the wanderers and the wanderers, families of all shapes and sizes, and people from every point along life's journey. No matter who you are or where you've been, no matter what you believe or even if you believe anything at all, you are welcome here and you belong here. Please take a moment to visit GoStAndrew.com slash sign in to let us know that you're here and to share some information about yourself. We'd love to know from where or from when you're joining us or if you have any prayer requests or questions about our church. If you would like to explore deeper engagement with the work God is doing in and through the St. Andrew community, you can email us directly at connect at GoStAndrew.com. We'd love to hear from you. Also, be sure to check out the announcement slides at the end of this video to see some upcoming events and opportunities to get more involved. You can also visit the events page on our website to see an updated events calendar. Lastly, if you would like to contribute a financial gift to the work and ministry of St. Andrew, you can visit GoStAndrew.com give or text St. Andrew to 28950. And now let's listen together as Reverend Jerry brings us the first sermon in our Advent series with us, Wonderful Counselor. Today's reading is from Romans chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is already the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then throw off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk decently as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in illicit sex and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires.
Now, I know what some of you, maybe most of you, are thinking. Just how long is that beard going to get? Well, imagine something between his current state and Gandalf the Grey from Lord of the Rings. I don't know. For now, as we enter the season of Advent, allow me to simply invite you into a time of expectation for a future that is not yet fully realized. Maybe what you're really thinking this week is, how can it already be Advent? I know, but here we are. And I admit that I am personally excited. We are finally here. The season of Advent is often a highlight of any congregation's life. It is a time of joy, color, light, and anticipation. At the same time, Advent is a reminder that there is more to come. That we are on a journey toward a new reality, a new way of being. Advent, from the Latin vineo, meaning coming, and ad, to, is more about what is next than what was before. It is less of a remembrance of the first coming of Christ and more of an anticipation of the completion of the promised kingdom. Now first, let me say that the season of Advent, Christmas, and Epiphany, without a doubt, as the song states, is the most wonderful time of the year. But why? I mean, the giving and receiving of gifts is great and all, but it has to be more than all that, right? After all, remember what the Grinch discovered? Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more. You know, as I prayed this week in preparation for this morning, a simple yet profound thought was revealed to me. The season is wonderful. Because inside of it all, there is a feeling that springs forth in our soul, even if we don't know where it comes from or why it is there. Regardless of who you are, what you believe, or your station in life, Advent and Christmas are seasons that awaken in every living soul a feeling of hope. Hope for renewal. Hope for peace. Hope for an end to needless suffering. Hope for finally finding a sense of purpose and belonging. Hope. Every single one of us in this sacred space can relate to that, can we not? This desire or feeling of expectation is elemental. Young or old, rich or poor, we all understand what it means to hope. For the ancients, living in the pitch black darkness of a long forgotten place where Spirits were dimmed and hopes were dashed and the future grew bleak and the world grew weary of itself. A light finally shined. At first distant and faint, it rose quietly over the people like the dawning of the sun until deep shadows gave way to sunburst of light and weeping gave way to outburst of joy and divine absence gave way to glad presence at the sound of a baby's first cry. The Christmas story is about a promise fulfilled, an age-old prophecy come to pass. Unto the ancients before us and now unto us and everyone who comes after us, into every pitch-dark place that ever has been or ever will be, a light shines eternally in the form of a child given, a wonderful counselor, mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, who calls us to walk in the light and love of God. So here at the beginning of our journey, allow me to invite you to explore this light, this hope, as we move toward the miracle of Christmas morning together. This week our journey begins with a reading from perhaps one of the most influential books of the New Testament, as it relates to the development of Christian doctrine and theology, Paul's letter to the Romans. Somewhere between 58 and 68 CE, the Apostle Paul did something expected and unexpected. He wrote a letter to a community he had never seen, to a group of people he had never met. I doubt Paul knew at the time the lasting impact his beautifully complex correspondence would generate. In the year 386 CE, a young pagan named Augustine was converted to the Christian faith by reading only two verses from Romans. Augustine would later write of this experience, explaining that, quote, 
I had no wish to read further. There was no need to. For it was as though my heart was filled with a light of confidence and all the shadows of my doubt were swept away. Eleven centuries later, in 1515, the Protestant Reformation began with the meditations of an Augustinian monk, Martin Luther, as he read from Romans, a letter he would soon come to call, quote, the gate of heaven, and later testify that by reading it, he had felt himself, quote, to be reborn and to have gone through open doors into paradise. Still again, a couple of centuries later in 1738, a young Anglican priest and one who would go on to begin the Methodist movement heard a commentary on Romans written by Martin Luther, read aloud at a meeting, and his life was changed forever. Later, John Wesley would write, I felt my heart strangely warmed. Then he said, I felt that I did trust in Christ alone for my salvation. You know, however you might encounter this book, it's hard to doubt the enormous impact that it has had on the history of Christianity. Now, I have to tell you, I love the way our text begins this morning. Paul writes, Beside this, you know what time it is how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. The words are bursting with depth and feeling. There is a sense of urgency one can feel in Paul's tone. A new day dawns, he says. Wake up, get ready, and get busy. You know, my smartphone offers at least 25 alarm options. It anticipates a morning of all scenarios. There are low-key ringtones for mornings when you have no particular place to go, no definitive to-do list. They have beautiful names like Morning Flower, Over the Horizon, Sea Breeze, Serene Morning, Spring of Hope, and my favorite, Blowing Dandelion Seeds. For those other kinds of mornings, the ones that hold high anxiety producing appointments, there are rousing ringtones, strident, like basic bell, beep, and uh, radar. Then there are mornings when you have no particular plans and can sleep late. The appropriate ringtone, or lack thereof, is snooze. Snooze is the one function, though, on my smartphone alarm I think that Paul would not approve of. Paul is adamant that the Roman church wake from sleep, and we as readers within the horizon of the text are exhorted to wake from sleep along with them. A laid-back ringtone like morning flower or blowing dandelion seeds is highly inappropriate for the urgency of this wake-up call. Furthermore, Paul's exhortation to wake up comes in the context of a broader biblical theme of watchfulness. The prophet Isaiah exhorts his listeners to Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. In 1 Thessalonians, we hear the words, For you are all children of the light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. The call of our faith is a call to be awake and watchful. Admittedly for Paul, some of this urgency comes from his perception that there only existed a short period of time between Christ's first coming and his second. And while that obviously did not happen, Paul's call to us is still important and holds wisdom for us to heed. He was right to believe that every moment in time is rich with divine possibility. He was right to urge his readers to wake up from sleep, to pay attention, and be alert to the imminent inbreaking of eternity within the flux of time, as theologian Karl Barth put it. You know, I wonder how many people today are dull to their own existence, asleep to the possibilities that exist all around them. Karl Barth called the age in which we live the time of, quote, great positive possibility. Why? I mean, I know that that may seem hard to swallow given the ebb and flow of events that we witness every day. But for Bard, 
because divine love has already conquered, there is, quote, this moment, the now, when past and future stand still. The former ceases its going, and the latter its coming. You see, in this sense, Christ was himself the turning point in time. The past might not be completely finished and gone, but the new has truly come. From this time forth, we are invited to dream along with God of a new heaven, a new earth, and a new way of being human, shaped and reshaped into God's image as we were supposed to be from the beginning. Loved ones claiming our faith and holding fast to the promises of God should give us a new outlook on everything. Yes, there is darkness in our world, and we should not deny that fact, nor should we dull our awareness of it into a form of apathy. But like Paul, as people of faith, we have glimpsed in Christ the glorious future God has for the world when the great positive possibility has finally carried the day. Thus, we can live in hope rather than in despair. We stay awake because we know God's salvation, God's grace and love, expressed in our deeds of compassion and in our words of comfort and kindness, can bathe our hurting world with a healing and restorative life-giving grace. You know, one winter morning I was hiking up in a heavily wooded area of the mountains, and it was cold. Between the cloud cover and the canopy of trees, the beams of sunlight were in short supply. Then as I sat down to rest, I felt a sudden warmth on my hand. I looked down and I saw a thin shaft of light warming the back of my hand. Impossible, I thought. It's too cloudy for the sun to shine. Nevertheless, as I glanced over my shoulder, there it was. The sun peeking through the clouds, orange, gold, as big as the world, shooting warming beams of light through the trees and providing a warmth that I could scarcely imagine. It was a light dispelling the cold and the darkness. A light, while not yet fully realized, held a promise of warmth and glory that would soon break through the clouds and shower everything with light, energy, and life. You know, during Advent, the notion of dissipating darkness is one that we model each Sunday as we light one additional candle right up to the point where we light the Christ candle, signifying simultaneously the moment when the light of the world was first born upon the earth and our hope that the light of the world will once again come and cast away every shadow of darkness. Advent is a season of hope. Hope that God's promised future will, in fact, arrive again as it did on the first Christmas. Now, there is also a challenge embedded in our text this morning. Paul calls us to wake up and put on Christ. And sometimes waking up and facing the reality of the day is hard. Somewhere on the way from the seeming simplicity of the way life used to be to the overwhelming complexity of the way life is now, a lot of us just decided it was all too much to take in. We pulled the covers over our heads and just went back to sleep. Paul says, however, that we can't live like that anymore if we choose to follow Christ. He says that the light of day has dawned and we have to pull the covers off our heads and get up and face the sunrise. In the light of day, we can no longer ignore the harsh realities of the world in which we live. I think part of the problem is that when we close our eyes to the hard things around us, the pain and suffering, the fear and the hatred, we also close our eyes to the good things. Yes, the light of Christ makes it clear that we cannot sit idly by and watch others suffer. But it also brings with it peace on earth and the tender mercy of God. 
The light that shines through Christ brings with it the joy and hope and love that our faith in him brings to life in us. That light makes it clear that even now, in spite of all the suffering and tragedy in this world, Christ is indeed making all things new. Our text this morning challenges us to wake up from our slumbers. We can no longer afford to linger in the various distractions that keep us stumbling around in the dark. We cannot continue to blame those who are different from us simply because it's easy. We cannot continue to ignore the suffering around us because it's too painful to watch. We cannot continue to indulge our selfishness just because it feels good to do so. The message of Advent is that with the coming of Christ, the day is dawned. And that means we have to throw the covers off our heads and get out of bed and walk into this hurting world bearing the light that Christ wants to bring into it through us. Now I realize there are a lot of people who try to do that all year long. And I realize that the immensity of the task can be overwhelming. There's just so many people who need our help. And those thoughts can lead us right back to the cycle of feeling overwhelmed, pulling the covers over our heads and simply sleepwalking through life. But the light of Christ that shines at Advent won't let us do that. It calls us to act as people who live in the light of day, as Paul puts it. I think at least part of what that means is that we live our lives in such a way as to bring the light to those around us. And if we have a hard time figuring out how to do that, maybe the first step is to decide we're going to treat the people around us, all the people around us, regardless of creed or color or economic status or educational background or whatever, with respect and kindness and compassion. We're going to see possibility in everyone. And that may not seem like much, but in our world it feels like it's tearing itself apart at the seams from hostility and anger and even hatred. Perhaps there's no better way for us to shine the light of Christ on the lives of the real people we come into contact with every day. And you know what, regardless of who you are, regardless of age, station, seeing possibility in others, spreading a message of compassion and light is something we are all capable of doing. It really doesn't take much, I promise. Sometimes even the smallest gesture can shine a light into the darkest regions of someone's life and revive a, a feeling of hope. In her little book, A Gift from God, Mother Teresa wrote these words. She writes, Some people came to Calcutta, and before leaving, they begged me, Tell us something that will help us to live our lives better. And I said, smile at each other. Smile at your wife. Smile at your husband. Smile at your children. Just smile at each other. It doesn't matter who it is. And that will help you grow up in great love for each other. Finally, there is something about the grammar of this text that reveals a fundamental aspect of Paul's thinking as it regards this new day. Subtly, all the appeals of these verses happen in the plural. Paul, therefore, assumes community. Throughout Romans, Paul describes a healthy relationship with God, to the earth, to ourselves, and to others. Friends, if we recognize mystery in our lives, if we live out the mystery of love, if we experience transformation that comes through genuine relationships, well then our own love flows spontaneously outward and reaches others. So beloved, I'll ask you just one more question. What time is it? It's time to awake. It's time to get out of bed and get ready, get dressed for the day. As Paul paints this picture, it is still dark outside when the theological alarm clock goes off. The day is near, but not quite here. 
Perhaps it is that mysterious moment when the darkness of night begins to give way to shadows and there is just enough light to know that morning is around the corner. This is a time of anticipation and Paul urges his audience and all of us to action. It is time to get up and get dressed. And the clothing Paul wants us to put on is Jesus Christ, his life, his way of being, and the garments that we are to put on as we get ready to meet the future. What concerns Paul here is that we adopt a new and more honorable way of life. Put aside all the things that dull the senses or draw attention away from what is really going on. And put aside quarreling and jealousy, things that destroy community and injure relationships with others. The new day that God is bringing is a time when God and humanity will be reconciled, when peace, justice, and integrity will be the hallmarks of human society. What Paul wants is for Christians to start living now, as though this new day has already begun. Amen. Director of the Wellbeing Initiative. 
It was a pleasure convening and working with the Wellbeing Community Board over the past year to examine health data, share personal perspectives, and identify gaps in our community. The group recently completed strategic planning, and we're excited to announce our focus areas moving forward. Hi, I'm Braden McCollum, a student at Rock Canyon High School and a member of the Wellbeing Community Board. From my experience, a trusted adult can make all the difference. A trusted adult is someone who actively listens, does not judge, and creates a safe space and a personal connection. Research suggests that young people who connect with at least one trusted adult have more coping skills, a stronger sense of belonging, connection, and well-being. And trusted adults can be a protective factor against suicide. I'm Megan Lee, a mother of young children, member of St. Andrew, and professional in the field of behavioral health. Did you know that depression, anxiety, suicide, and school shootings have been associated with a lack of sense of belonging and connectedness? With this in mind, we have set a vision for the Wellbeing Initiative that all young people have a sense of belonging, social connectedness, and well-being. And I'm Doug Slaughter, a retired United Methodist minister and part of the St. Andrew community. My background is pastoral ministry and counseling. We knew we wanted to focus on prevention and identify upstream strategies to better support young people and create a community where all young people can thrive. We also know that resilience is an important part of navigating life. Resilience is the ability to manage and rebound from difficult situations, and coping skills are a key part of that. So we have decided to focus on helping young people develop coping skills. So there you have it. Our focus series moving forward will be coping skills for young people and trusted adults to support them. I would like to personally thank the Wellbeing Community Board members who brought us to this point. Now are you with us? Please stay tuned as we launch efforts over the next few months to make a big difference in our community. And now, as you return to the rhythms and routines of your busy lives this week, I leave you with this Advent benediction from Pamela Cranston, entitled Poem, An Open Door, on a theme by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Look how long the weary world waited, locked in its lonely cell, guilty as a prisoner. As you can imagine, it sang and whistled in the dark. It hoped. It paced and puttered about, tidying its little piles of inconsequence. It wept from the weight of ennui, draped like shackles on its wrists. It raged and wailed against the walls of its own plight. But there was nothing the world could do to find its own freedom. The door was shut tight. It could only be opened from the outside. Who could believe the latch would be turned by a pink flower, the tiny hand of a newborn baby? <laughs>